multiple regression. Now, this may seem a little bit more familiar than talking about matrix algebra like we were last time, or other topics that we've talked about so far, like data screening, because you know, regression, for a lot of us at least, who've had some exposure to regression, but usually of the sort of simple regression kind, usually one predictor, one outcome, you may have had some, you know, a course that dove a little deeper in there and got into some multiple regression and talking about sort of looking at how to control for covariates and things and in your regression. But my gut tells me you probably have not seen a whole lot of it, at least not in the classroom, at least not, you know, in a lecture style or in, in, a, in a lab. You may have learned some through applications with professors that you're working with or something like that, but probably not a whole lot in the classroom, at least not at this point. So even though, again, this is not multivariate, let's talk about multiple regression because we're still talking about one outcome, but we're making our way towards things like kind of correlation and the MANOVA where we start to have more outcomes, but we got to talk about how it works, how things go with one outcome first before we can sort of switch gears to more than one outcome. Multiple regression is pretty straightforward. You have one DV and a bunch of predictors. There's no like technical limit on the number of predictors you can have. You can have as many as you want, as many as sort of conceivable for your design. However, there is a sort of diminishing returns. The more predictors you add in, eventually they're going to start to weaken the model, potentially making it not very predictive of the dependent variable. Because as, as predictors start to overlap and start to predict the same variance in the outcome, they start to not be so useful anymore. So we're assuming that the outcome is at least interval ratio, right? It's a Likert scale or some kind of continuously scored scale. At least we're going to treat it that way. Uh, as opposed to logistic regression, which is, you know, dichotomous or ordinal. We're going to assume here that it is continuous. Okay. The predictors, well, they don't really have that restriction. They can be dichotomous. They can be continuous. They can even be ordinal. Mm, they can be categorical, but you have to do some things to... To, to address those so that they work well within multiple regression, but we'll get there, okay? We talked about this before, this, this normally distributed distribution. And we're assuming that Y is normally distributed. So no skewness, no outliers. The X's don't need to necessarily be normally distributed, but if they're continuous and they are normally distributed, it makes sort of for, it makes for a stronger interpretation of the relationship between the X's and the Y. And we're assuming that the relationship between the X's and Y are linear, but there's always like a little asterisk on there. We can account for some curvilinear relationships using powers and other stuff that we'll talk about more as we get into the lecture series. We're also assuming that there are no multivariate outliers among the X's predicting the Y. So of all the predictors, as I was saying a second ago, you want the predictors to be unique. You want them to contribute to the outcome, predict the outcome in, in, a, in a unique and an unique way. Because if not, they're just going to be redundant. They're going to be explaining the same thing. We're getting that multicollinearity assumption or issue that we talked about in the data screening section. Right? So we want to make sure there's no multivariate outliers among those X's predicting Y. We can look for things like influence and, and, and how outliers are sort of working to affect the scores, but especially as they are put into the model, how they predict why. So we talked about leverage and discrepancy and influence, but just as a reminder, leverage sort of has to do with the distance, the farther away the a point is from the rest of the scores, the more leverage it has. Discrepancy has to do with how aligned it is. If it's lined up along the regression line, yeah, it's not, not going to have a whole lot of, uh, of influence on the model because it's, it's sort of falling in line with all the other points. The problem comes down when you have a point that's misaligned, 
that seems to be going a different direction from all the other points, and it has a lot of leverage, well, then it's going to have a lot of influence, which means that the slope and potentially the intercept and things, but the slopes are going to change to try to account for this influential point. It's actually going to change the slope. It's going to change the model. There's lots of ways that, that this, this model-based outlier thing is tested in places like SPSS. There's statistics to look at how the, the changes in the slopes actually are, you know, what, what changes there are in the slopes with and without a particular score, just so I give you an idea of, of the influence. We're also uh, just looking at how NOBIS distances and how data points combine to represent multivariate outliers in uh, in the data. And so we, t we, we talk about this a little bit in the data screening section as well, that you can look at how far it'll give you in square, in chi-squared units, it'll give you how far each point is away from the centroid of all the points. And the centroid is the center of multivariate space. We talked about, can I use that bottle to sort of represent that? Anyway, this is sort of looking at each point individually. So it's not necessarily multivariate, but I guess it could be. But really, Malinova's distance is a multivariate test for, uh, for, for outliers, for multivariate combinations of scores that represent an outlier. We talked about our, our favorite you know, 50 cent word here, homoscedasticity. If you haven't tried at least practicing saying that word aloud to yourself just for fun, you should try. It's just, it's interesting. It's just a, it's a mouthful. Homo scedasticity. It's a lot of syllables. Anyway, we, we assume variance on Y is the same in all values of X. We talked about that in the data screening section. When particulars are categorical, this is referred to as homogeneous variance, and it's probably something you've seen a bunch when talking about ANOVA or T-tests or other between groups kinds of tests where we, we assume homogeneity of variance. Now, we talked about multi-clinearity multi and singularity. I didn't really get into a whole lot of detail about sort of how it's tested. So here I'm giving you a couple of, of ideas of, of what, you know, how, how multi-clinearity is tested in programs like SPSS, in packages in R, like Psych, and, you know, in SAS and other places like that. So one measure of multiclinearity is something called tolerance. The tolerance is sort of an odd, an odd thing. I mean, I'm not sure. I probably should look into the history of it. I'm not sure why they, it, it got turned into this this metric, this one minus squared multiple correlation metric. But it is it is what it is. So with tolerance, let's say you have you have multiple victims. So let's say you have a Y and you have, you know, a few predictors in there that you're trying to use to predict Y. I'll be like two of them. B2, X2, B3, X3. Okay, so we have three predictors. And of course, there's the intercept in there somewhere. We have three predictors. What tolerance does and what the squared multiple correlation does is it for a second, it forgets about Y. This is all about the predictors. We want the predictors not to be redundant when predicting Y. But for a second, let's forget about Y. What we're gonna do is we're gonna test each predictor for, its, for, for tolerance. So we're gonna get a value for tolerance for each one. What that does is we're gonna take X1 and we're gonna predict X1. I'm gonna forget the slopes and all that stuff for a second. I'm just gonna say X1 is gonna be predicted by X2 and X3 for a second. X2 is going to be predicted by X1 and X3. And X3 is going to be predicted by X1 and X2. Okay. We're going to make these three different predictions. So we're going to get like an X1 predicted, predicted, predicted. And what a multiple correlation is looking at, that's the capital R, right? For, so for X1, I want to know what's the correlation between X1 and X1 predicted. Right? The X1 that is being predicted by X2 and X3. And this will tell me how much that these two variables overlap with X1. So if I combine X1 and X2 using their slopes, right, B2, B3, I combine X2 and X3 into a prediction of X1. So this is why I'm saying it's it's 
it's x1 predicted right it's, it's the hat version of this right it's the predicted version of it right i want to know can i predict x1 and x2 and x3 now if they're not if they're not correlated if they if they have no correlation whatsoever this should be sort of zero this, this is optimal we want the for all three of them optimally we want the correlation between x2 and x2 predicted to be zero and we want the correlation between x3 and x3 predicted predicted to be zero all right this would be like ideal right because that this means that all the predictors are completely independent and we you know there's no overlap between any of them and any prediction they have for towards y is going to be completely unique not going to overlap at all it's not likely to be the case so realistically we just want these it, not to be zero we want these to be low right so the the lower they are the lower the multiplicity right? as these start to get high these these multiple correlations these are the the smcs right? these are the squared multiple correlations Yes, and I guess I should technically be looking at these squared values, just because what we really want is the squared multiple correlation, not just the multiple correlation. But we want these to be as low as possible, because if I look at the squared multiple correlation here, right between say x one x predicted, x one predicted is a combination of x two and x three. If that r squared is zero, that means that x two and x three have zero prediction or zero, zero overlapping variance with x1. They have no overlap whatsoever. As this gets larger, it tells me what percentage of x1 is overlapping or at least is, is explained by x2 and x3. At what point does that start to get, get problematic? Well, I would argue that if these values are even in the in the 0.8 range, which actually seems pretty high, right? If these are if these are in the 0.8 range, that already seems pretty problematic. Because it means that, like for instance, for x1, if x1, if the r, if the multiple r, r squared, multiple squared multiple correlation, this, this r squared, if this is close to 0.8, that means that 80% of x1 is accounted for by x2 and x3. It means these two overlap with x1 by like 80%. Well, uh, that's completely redundant. But if you actually look in the Tavashkin-Fellow book and other places, they, they describe this thing called tolerance. Well, tolerance, that says right there, is 1 minus the SMC. So for all these, like, let's say for my x1, let's say for x1, the r squared for x1 with x1 predicted, right? If that's 0.8, that means my tolerance for that is going to be 0.2. Right? So that's 1 minus the squared multiple correlation. So 1 minus 0.8 gives me 0 0.2. 0 0.2, as a tolerance, already seems to, to me to be rather indicative of a problem. But to Boston and Fidel, they actually list the values as 0.01. All right, so. They're saying that, th that these values have to be of the 0.99. They have to be up, what was it, 0.99 before the problem? That seems, if you're at 0.99, that, that you're basically at singularity. So even though this is what is quoted in the, in, this is what's written in the book, this values of less than 0.01 indicate a problem, I think you have a problem long before that. I think, you know, if you're at 0.2, even 0.3, you know, depending on what's going on, Values of of, in, of the tolerance of 0 0.3, 0 0.2 can already start to indicate there's an issue. Why? Because it tells you that there's a ton of overlap. It's going to matter. We're, we're going to get to looking at these these sort of diagrams and why I can explain it a little better. In terms of it, really matters is the part that the two that that these variables overlap with x1, right? The variance that they share is that the same variance that x1 shares with y? If it is, then this, then even values of 0 0.5 are going to be problematic because it's going to be these two are going to be removing variance from this that it uses to predict y, and that makes sort of it's going to render it sort of useless or at least inconsequential as the the model goes on. So this is where you get those cases where you can have an overall significant multiple regression, but the individual predictors are not significant because they, they're overlapping so much.
So tolerance is away. And again, I don't know why I came down to this one minus SMC as a measure, but the lower the values, the worse it is. And I think this is actually, this is well beyond knowing when you have a problem. Okay. All right, what about the condition index? Now this is a little bit premature in terms of talking about what this is and that sort of where these values come from. It'll make more sense when we get to factor analysis later on. But what this does is it actually takes a ratio of eigenvalues from the data set. So if you have four variables, let's say you have four variables, just making up a number, that means you can extract, extract four eigenvectors. And this is gonna seem like complete nonsense for now, an eigenvector, right? Sounds like some kind of special, like, I don't know why I might think of German, a special German vector, eigen, eigenvector. But it, it, it's, it's a way of extracting, it's a way of extracting linear representations of dimensions within large sets of data and usually you can you can extract as many out as you have variables. So if I have four variables, I can extract out four eigenvalues, eigenvectors, I mean. And for each one of those, it's going to be you're going to be each eigenvector that gets extracted will also have four. Each one of them is going to have an eigenvalue. So you're going to get four eigenvalues that go along with that. And eigenvalues are eigenvalues tell you a bit about the quality of the eigenvector. So an eigenvector, you know, don't think of anything as more as it's just a it's a it's a projection through space, right? It's a it's a linear projection through space trying to explain a bunch of variables all together. So like multidimensional regression, so it's a vector that gets put through space. The amount of variance that this eigenvector explains is usually you know, in the eigenvalue. It tells you the eigenvalue tells you how much variance this explains. Okay. What does that have to do with this? Again, this is a quick, again, if none of this makes sense, don't worry about it. We're gonna talk more about this stuff later on when it comes down to factor analysis, but this is just as, as a preview. And when you get there later on, you, you, you can look back at this and be like, oh yeah, okay, that makes more sense. As eigenvectors get projected into space, right? They usually, the first one that gets projected usually is the best one because it has free reign. They can put whatever it wants. So it can explain the most Variance and therefore I have the largest eigenvalue. Okay, so what does that mean? So as these things get projected into space, the first eigenvalue, if there is if, if the if the values actually relate to each other, if there is any shared variation, actually I can put it there, there's any shared variation between the variables like our predictors and our regression equation, if there are put down here. The first eigenvector, the first eigenvector, eigenvector, will be the largest. Right. It's going to extract the most, the, the most variance. It's going to have the largest eigenvalue. Okay. The second one, it's going to be smaller. Right. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be smaller. And it's going to keep cycling down until you go through all of the eigenvectors. All right, it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller until what you'll see is something else. I'm, you know, we'll come back to this later on. Well, the scree plot where you have like here's your first, call it my first EV, EV1. Yeah, E eigenvalue 2. If I have three variables, I expect to find those. What you're going to find in terms of the what y is here is the sort of the size of the eigenvalue. It's going to be the largest, the first one. It's going to go down tremendously for the second one, even more for the third one, like that. It's going to you're going to have some pattern like that where it's going to just be diminishing returns. You're going to have less and less variance. First one's going to explain the most. Second one explains the second. Blah blah blah, all the way down. All right, this is a, a, a quick. A very dirty way of getting to the point of why they use this condition index. What a condition index does is it says, all right, I'm going to take the ratio of the first eigenvalue, which is the, the largest one, 
right? The first value that goes along with the eigenvector, the first variance explained by the eigenvector. We're going to take <laughs> eigen, I keep doing up there, and it's not that I can't do that. I'm going to take eigenvalue one, I'm going to divide that by eigenvalue two, and that's going to give me a condition index. Condition index one. That's going to tell me the ratio of the first to second eigenvalues. Okay. And then I'm going to get the ratio of the first to the third eigenvalue. That's going to be condition index two. It's going to keep doing that for for as many as many times as you have variables. It's going to take the ratio of the first to sort of next eigenvalue. One over two, one over three, one over four, one over five, one over six. It's going to keep doing that to get a ratio of how much larger the first eigenvalue. Remember I said the first eigenvalue is going to be the biggest one. It's going to be the largest one. If, and again, this may not make any sense at this point. It'll make more sense later, but just in case. If the ratio of the first to any other eigenvalue is larger than 30, according to this, this approach, is larger than 30, that means that there is evidence that the variables are related. Why? Because if the variables are related to one another and you and you put an eigenvector through space, it's able to explain a ton of variance for the very first one. It tells you that as a group, they all relate to each other. They're all fairly factorable in terms of factor analysis, as we get to later on, relative to other eigenvalues. So it's presence of in I in factor analysis speak, it's present the presence of a general factor. There is something that explains the relationship between all the variables really well. It has such a large eigenvalue relative to other ones. Okay, so if it's over 30, that tells you that there is a problem, okay? that, that there is enough of a, of a relationship between all the predictors, all the items that you have, all the x's, that there's likely an issue. But then the question comes down to, okay, well, where is the issue? What variables are actually highly related to one another that might be driving the first eigenvalue to be very large? Well, we can look at then at the variance on the variables and find two of them that are over 0.5. So we need both of these things, condition index over 30, and then two variables that have a, a variance over 0.5 Combined with that, it will tell you that there is multicollinearity, and it will tell you which variables are contributing to the multicollinearity at the same time. This will make more sense as we go in the lab and we actually get an output you know, from SPSS that looks at a test for multicollinearity and that you actually get tolerance and you get a condition index. You also get other things like the variance inflation factor. The variance inflation factor, which we, I didn't mention, it's not on this, on this list, but it is an SPSS, it's simply, if I remember correctly, hopefully this is right, I'll check it. If it isn't, I'll, I'll correct it. It's just one over tolerance. That's supposed to be a way of telling you how much the variance has been inflated, has been biased by the presence of the multicollinearity. So the so VIF is the variance inflation factor. And usually when you ask for this stuff in SPSS, you're getting for each variable, you're getting tolerance. I shouldn't say for each variable, for each predictor, because we're not doing this for Y. We're doing it. We want Y to be predicted by other stuff. We just don't want the X's to predict one another. So we're getting one for each X. We're getting a condition index for all of them collectively. But but each of the variances are going to tell you which uh, which variables are contributing to the problem. And then we're going to get a VIF for each for each variable at the same time. And it gives you information about to, to help you decide when variables are too overlapping, too similar, too sharing too much variability. Okay. That was a lot. Again, if this doesn't quite ring a bell and you're like confused, what the hell is an eigenvector? Forget about the fact that it's an eigenvector. It's just there's a vector, a line being projected out in space. And for each of those lines, it's gonna it's gonna explain a certain amount of vari variance that we call a value. The larger the value is, the more that vector is doing a good job of explaining a lot of variables with one single vector. Okay? That helps us to sort of create this condition index and look at what variables may be contributing to that. This will come back again when we talk about factor analysis. We're, we're going to use eigenvectors and eigenvalues in factor analysis.
but it may not make a whole lot of sense now if you've not seen or heard of these things before. But they're just fancy terms for a line in space and how much that line explains variance in that space. And that's it. Simple when you think of it that way, but it's just more complicated because it's a mathematical approach to doing that. All right, so let's think about this regression equation. This is something that we're sort of familiar with. At least I hope you are. You may have seen it written differently. It's it's still a strange thing to me that we oftentimes here it's y predicted equals a plus bx, whatever. But oftentimes with simple regression that you've taken maybe in high school, junior high school, it was probably y predicted equals mx plus b, where m is the slope. B is the intercept. And then all of a sudden we switch over to talking about A being the intercept, B being the slope. And well, multi regression, each predictor, oftentimes these are called covariates, each covariate in the model is attached to its own slope. And even, even more confusing, and this is actually true of SPSS, lots of places actually will refer to all of them as Bs, where A, the intercept will be referred to as B0, and everything else then is the same, B1, B2, B3, B4. Because in SPSS, when you ask for regression, and you get your table of coefficients, the intercept and the slopes are all in the same column, and they're labeled as coefficients or as Bs. They're all Bs. So this is just a B0, it's intercepts. So even though we get used to it being A, B0, there as well. All right, so when we saw this, you know, when you saw this before in, you know, in a math class in high school or even in, in college or something, again, you probably saw this as y predict equals bx plus a or mx plus b or whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is that the thing next to the predictor, the thing next to the x is the slope. The other thing is the intercept. So A is the intercept, B is the slope. Great. So that's helpful if what we want to do is just, you know, draw things, right? And in psychology and other social sciences, drawing this stuff is not really what we want to, I mean, this is great, but it's not really what we want to do. It's not really as useful as you might think. We actually want to in the A's and B's for different reasons. So what is A and what is B in that sense? How else can we interpret the Bs? Let's go back to just a simple form. My predicted equals BX plus A. So what is B and what is A? Now I know that B is the slope, A is the intercept. What does that matter? You're probably thinking, well, okay, well, B is the slope. You might even thinking the rise over run in your head, oh, it's a rise over run, right? I go up a certain amount, over a certain amount, so I can actually figure out the dots on the line. I can figure that out. That's true. It is that. But again, why, why do we care about rise over run in psychology? Oftentimes, we're interested in whether or not this is significant or not, and we will interpret it, but it has, it has a, a more appropriate meaning, uh, interpretation to it. And what about the A? A, you're probably are thinking, well, that's the Y intercept, right? It's the intercept, it's the, it's the place where, you know, the line crosses the Y axis, which is true. But again, if the goal was simply to, to draw these graphs, then that'd be it, we'd be done. We wouldn't need further interpretation. That's not really useful. Not an interpretation, you know, in psychology and things. All right, so let's think about it another way. B, you can think of B as a converter. It's a conversion property, right? It's converting. I'm trying to convert X into Y. I'm trying to make X into Y. I'm trying to use as much X as I can to predict Y, right? So I'm trying to convert X into Y. That's why when you, if you were to create a regression equation and then flip X and Y around and predict X from Y, the slope changes, it's a different slope because the conversion is now reversed. You're con converting in a different direction. So that's why they don't stay the same. But again, even a converter, I wonder, why, why would, you know, psychology, we need a converter. What it tells us, let's say we had some numbers in here. 
say that y predicted equals, I don't know, 1.2x plus 3. So right away, we go back to our, our, our interpretations we just talked about a second ago. That would tell me that right here, you know, the line is crossing y at 3, right? And then it's going up you know, 1.2 units. We can sort of create this line doing that. We can draw the points or whatever, which is, again, which is fine, but that's not what I want. I think it's going to, it goes, it, it'll go up 1.2 and then over one, up 1.2 over one, whatever. So again, think about it again as a converter. As X changes, this is our X, this is our Y, but I'm going to label my axes, right? We got a bunch of stuff all here. It's X is continuous. So this is going from, let's say this is at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What it tells me is that as X goes, goes up one unit, right? So as X increases one unit, I expect Y to go up 1.2, right? So for every unit change in X, Y predicted, not Y, but Y predicted is going to change 1.2. I would expect a 1.2 unit change for every in y for every change in one unit of x. Okay, I'll say it one more time. As x changes one unit, we expect y predicted to go up 1.2. Right, so, that's, that, so that's the conversion that we're doing. Right? Y predict is changing slightly faster than x is. X is going up one, y is going up 1.2. In order to sort of convert x into y to predict y from x, I'm going to multiplied by 1.2. This tells me the amount of change to expect as things change. So imagine this is something like IQ. Uh, let's, let's do it differently. Let's say this is like depression and this is anxiety. That as anxiety goes up one unit, we expect, sorry, as depression, again, this is depression, this is anxiety, predictor is depression, anxiety is the outcome. As depression goes up one unit, I expect anxiety to go up 1.2 units. Right? The anxiety to increase slightly faster than depression increases. So then what's the three? It is the point where it crosses the y-axis, but again, that's not super interesting. What does the y-axis represent? Well, the y-axis, if it's sort of drawn appropriately, should be the place where it crosses zero. So when x is zero, x is zero, y predicted will be three. Okay? When x is zero, y predicted is three. So going back to our depression and anxiety thing, right? If I have zero depression, no depression at all, I would still expect someone's anxiety to be at three. So, so this is sort of mm, like a baseline. It tells you even if you don't have any other predictor, that's how much to expect someone to have of whatever you're measuring, whatever this outcome is, given that they don't have any of the X. Sometimes, depending on how we code this, it could be different. Sometimes, for instance, if X is gender, zero for males, one for females, and let's say this is, we're trying to predict GPA or something like that. Zero now become is for males, right? So zero is males. That tells me that for males, I would predict that they would have GPA of three, right? For males, because this is what I expect when X is zero. So if X is zero and X being zero is when they're male, men, males, boys, I would expect because again, this drops out, this is zero, I expect Y predict to be three. So I predict three for that group. Well, then what do I expect for, for women, for females? As as the, as Y goes up one unit, zero to one, I would expect the outcome, which is, I think I said GPA, to go up 1.2. So I'd add 1.2 to three, and I'd have that we'd expect them to be at 4.2 GPA. So it, the interplay between this is sort of this this tells us where we'd expect things to be whenever x is zero 
as sort of a baseline, but it could also be the control group, depending on how you sort of how you how you are using the X predictors. And then the slope tells us well how much do you expect people to change above or change away from that baseline for every unit change in X. Okay, so this is great, useful. Hopefully that that explanation sort of resonates with you somewhat. It's good. But this is still just for a simple regression. Right? It's still just simple, just one predictor. What about up here? How does it change? Well, it doesn't change much. Because here, what we would say the slope is as x changes one unit, y predicted changes the slope, it changes b, it changes in this case 1.2. The intercept is still it, it, it interpreted the same way. Y predicted it equals a when all the x's are zero. Right? So all the x's have to be zero. And that gives us sort of a baseline for what y predicted should be. Right? It's the point where y, the line crosses the y-axis. It's the y-intercept. But it's also sort of a baseline. This is why it's important to make sure that the zero points on these x's are actually meaningful. Because if these zeros don't mean much of anything, this, this, the intercept won't be very meaningful either. Okay, so, so we'll come back to that and talk about that more later on. We'll talk about centering and some other stuff. But again, this intercept still interpreted the same way, even though we, I can't even draw it, right? This has now got, at least with this, it's got three dimensions. I can't even, I have to draw another, you know, another dimension coming out. Right? So I can't even draw it past two dimensions very well. Maybe with a computer you can do it, but if you go to four or five or any more predictors, we can't really do it very much anymore. The only thing that changes is that the slopes still represent the amount that Y predicted changes for every unit change in X. That's still the same. It hasn't changed. It's still this, these conversion factors. We have to add a little bit of condition on there. The condition is B1, so like Y predicted will change B1 for every unit change in X. So that's ch X changes one unit. Y predicted will change B1 as long as the other X's remain the same. So oftentimes you hear it say, controlling for the other X's or holding all other X's constant. So if I don't change X2 or X3 or four or five, I keep all the other X's const you know, constant, they don't change. I just change the one variable, Y predicted it will change the slope or some multiplier of the slope. If this changes five units, this is gonna change the y is going to change five times b1, right? So every unit change, but you have to add in there that controlling for other variables or keeping all the other x's constant. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Intercept remains the same. The value for y predicted when all the x all, all the x's are zero, and the slopes now are interpreted the same way. It's the amount of change in y for every unit change in that x holding all the other x's constant or controlling for all the other predictors, okay? So why y predicted? Like, why do I keep writing writing y predicted or y hat, right? If these things mean the same thing. You'll see them both written out or this is like the lazy sort of way, especially when it comes to stuff being typed out. Y predicted is the same thing as y hat, but also y predicted. So why y predicted and not, not y? If I were to change the equation slightly, which is to just add in this an error for each individual like that, each each person add an error in there, then we could talk about it being y, not y predicted. What this equation actually predicts, again, forget about you know, forget about the error for a second. What this equation predicts is not the points, because here's all the points in Y, right? All over, they're all over here. All the like points. This equation gives us the line, where the line falls. So Y predicted equals the intercept plus all these slopes and, and predictors. But if I want to get back to one of these points, like if I actually want to predict a Y point, I have to take into account the difference between each point and the line, this is a residual. This is an E, it's an error. It's how far each point is away from the line. So if I add that into the equation, if I add in, you know, an E here, I can then make it just, I can make, 
over. I can make it, I can take that off and make it just y. Because y equals this equation plus or minus some error, some residual variability that, that goes around that, that line. So if you see this just y, it's got to have e in it. It's got to have the errors. So we got to take into account how far away it is from the, from the predicted line. Or y predicted is simply just the point on that line. Okay. Then we talked a little bit about the multiple regression equation. And we spent probably more time than you really wanted to talking about all the individual pieces. What kinds of things, like when would you actually use multiple regression? The interesting fact is that, that I, I want to try to reiterate over the course of this semester is that you've been using multiple regression this whole time. Mo just about everything that we do from, you know, uh, simple ANOVAs, factorial ANOVAs, most of the things that we've taught like in, five, in 485 or even 320, like t-tests and stuff, are just special types of regression. It's just multiple regressions done in a very specific way. With, with ANOVAs, they're just ANOVAs done with very specific types of coding, contrast coding as opposed to dummy coding or something like that. But again, I want to reiterate everything. So I'm saying like, oh, what kind of questions can you ask with regression? Well, you've already been asking them. You've already been doing it. You've already been, been using multiple regression in class, at least, if not in your research with your advisors or on your own, you've been doing it. We just got to talk a little bit about how all that works. Things like ANOVA and COVA, all those sort of univariate approaches are all just some form of multiple regression. It's done special cases of multiple regression. And they're all sort of under one big umbrella of the general linear model. So keep that in mind. This is nothing new. It's nothing special or different or whatever. It's just the same thing you've been learning. We're just going to talk about it in a more general sense that it applies to more cases and more places. And you can have combinations of, of, continuous and dichotomous or categorical variables that is not really as straightforward as something like ANOVA where you can't just mix together the predictors unless you're doing an ANCOVA. But keep that in mind, multiple regression, ANOVA, all this stuff is all part of this general linear model and it's all the same stuff. So not, nothing new, nothing crazy. We're going to dive a little deeper into it, but it's not new. It's just a new use or expanded use from what you've seen before. All right, so the, the first and somewhat obvious question is, well, can I even predict Y with these X's? All right, I got a bunch of X's. I have a Y. I want to predict it. Is there an actual prediction? So we can look at this in a couple of different ways. There's the ANOVA summary table, which gives you a significance test, and that because that breaks down all the variability in Y in terms of the variability that's explained by the X's. That's the regression variability, the sum of squares regression. And then there's the variability that's not related to the X's, which is the residual variance. So we look at those, the regression variance and the residual variance, we can actually then create a, an F test with that and, and have an ANOVA test with it. We can look at, it's actually the same thing, but a, a slightly different way of looking at it is R square, capital R square, the multiple correlation square, the squared multiple correlation, the SMC. This tells you the, the amount of variation in Y accounted for by, by the set of predictors. And again, I want to reiterate this because it, I, I remember it was way later on in my career when I sort of it dawned on me, and I finally understood what was being said by all this stuff. So if I'm creating some kind of prediction, right, where I have Y predicted equals B1X1 plus B2X2 plus B three x three all right creating this prediction i'm leaving out the the intercept now because it's not necessarily related to this but when i'm creating this y predict i guess i might as well leave it in there okay all a, a multiple correlation is the capital r squared is right because this is this is the portion of y that is explainable by the x's right so the the multiple correlation for y is simply just a simple correlation between y, the original y, 
and y predicted. How much does this predicted y, how much does this y, I should say squared, what percentage of the of the actual y, the, the, the outcome, overlaps with this predicted y, where we're combining, we're converting all these x's over to some prediction of y, this y hat variable, how much do they overlap? The percentage that they overlap is the multiple r squared. Okay? So variation y accounted for by, by the set of predictors. Well, how do we get it? Well, the set of predictors, we just said that all these set of predictors is this, is y predicted. So if I just take a correlation between y and y predicted, I have a multiple correlation. Now there's another one, I, oftentimes when you ask for multiple regression in SPSS or other programs, you'll get the capital R squared, but you'll also get something called adjusted R squared. Now, it, it, there's some sample variation around R squared can lead to inflation of the values. It, 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 basically, it's a fancy way of saying R squared, capital R squared is not a population parameter. It's not something that, you know, it's, it's not perfect. It's going to change somewhat from sample to sample. It's going to have some variation to it. So the adjusted R squared is trying to take into account the sample size, other aspects of the predictors and outcome to, to adjust it so, that it so it's a better estimate of the population value. So larger samples, you're going to see that uh, the adjusted R squared and R squared are going to be more similar because they're larger. Those that have, have I think, less variability, more, predi more predictors also, I think, lead to, to less differences between these. So there's just a bunch of stuff is adjusting for to make this a better population estimate, not just a, a sample parameter. So an R squared is similar to A to squared, which, um, which hopefully you've touched on in a previous course, which is getting at the percentage of overlap. It, it's similar, but uh, R squared really only looks at linear relationships where A to squared can account for some nonlinear non stuff that R squared doesn't. So not always the same, but oftentimes they, you'll get the same value for both. As long as everything's sort of normally distributed linear, you'll get the same values for for R squared and A to squared as you would for an ANOVA. Anyway, so the larger the overlap, the multiple correlation is between the Y and predicted Y, right, the better prediction you have. If this is really low, close to zero, well then your ANOVA is likely going to be not significant. As it gets larger, this ANOVA is gonna be significant. It's telling you there's more and more percentage of overlap between the predictors and the outcome. So this is one way, a couple different ways you can actually look at it. In output from SPSS, you're going to get both of them. It's going to give you the ANOVA summary table, which is the overall sort of test. It's also going to give you a test of the R squared. And for the most part, they're going to be the exact same value because it's really testing the same thing. Asking whether or not there's a significant prediction of Y from the X's is the same thing as saying, is the multiple the squared multiple correlation significantly different than zero. So it's the same, essentially the same question. And that's why I'll notice that it's, it seems a bit redundant in some of the output. But one thing to keep in mind is that this, this test, the ANOVA, the R, the capital R square, the multiple correlation, it's testing for the X's holistically. It's as a group, as a set of X's, right? It's doing it holistically. It's not looking at individual predictors. It's just looking as a group, do they predict the outcome significantly? We can also ask if each X is contributing significantly to the prediction of Y. So this is a different, slightly like different question is like, we can ask the big picture question, like, is there you know, a, a significant prediction of Y at all? And then we can ask, okay, well, if there is an overall significant prediction of Y, which X's are actually significantly contributing to that prediction? So we can test each regression coefficient if each regression coefficient is significantly different than zero and given that variable standard error, right? So we can use the value, we can compute a standard error for, we can divide those and get t-tests. So you're gonna get a t-test for each coefficient and it's gonna tell you whether or not that's significantly different than zero.
if it's significant, it tells you that there is, there is a relationship between that X and the outcome Y after controlling for all the other variables in the model. So the overlap's been taken care of already and still contributing a, a significant, unique contribution to the prediction of the outcome. Okay. Now, since we're talking about the contribution of each X to the prediction of Y, well, why not talk about which X is the best, right? Which is, which is doing the most prediction, which is the best predictor. You gotta be a little careful because if you're looking at the actual slope values, the B values, you cannot interpret the relative size of the Bs because they're, they're in their own metric, right? So if you're talking about GPA as a predictor, that's gonna have a very different range and, and predicted sort of size for the slope than if you're talking about salary or something as a predictor, right? So there, so you have to, you can't just compare the Bs directly because they reflect the scale that those predictors are measured in. So what we do instead is oftentimes we'll, we'll uh, standardize the slopes, create betas instead of Bs. They're standardized, which means that we've converted, the predictors and the outcomes have all been converted to Z-scores. So this, the mean and standard deviation and stuff have all been standardized. The mean's been taken out. Everything has been standardized. And then we compute the relationships between the Xs and the standardized Xs and the standardized Y. And that gives us beta values. They're standardized slope values. Those, because we've we moved the scale out, we've, we've subtracted the mean out, we've divided by the, the standard deviation to, to create the Z-scores, they're now on the same scale, right? They're all on a similar Z-scale. So the betas now can be compared directly and it can tell you just how large one is relative to the other. And you can get an idea of what the best predictor is. What, what X is predicting the most, or doing the most contribution to the prediction of Y. A, a being the grand mean on Y, right? So if you actually subtract out the grand mean on Y, A is going to be zero when, when you standardize everything because you're sort of taking the, the level out. Everything's being leveled out. It's being centered at zero. So there's no longer any intercept other than zero. So oftentimes when you see a standardized equation like this, you don't see an A. There's no like Z for A or whatever. There's no standardized version for A because it's essentially just zero. It's been zeroed out by subtracting all the means out of everything. One of the things that regression seems perfectly designed for, but I don't think it's used as often as maybe it should get used, is can you predict future scores? Can you actually use what you know and in, in the data that you have to predict what will happen with new data that comes in? This is done. For instance, you know, when, when you submit your application materials to grad school or to undergrad, you know, that kind of stuff, the, you know, some schools will actually put the information into a prediction equation to actually look at how, you know, predicting how successful it might be based on what they know of previous students. All right, so th these kinds of things can happen. There, there are models for predicting like heart attacks based on what they know about people and, and signs for heart attack and that kind of stuff. So predict, predicting future scores is actually a big part of what's going on. It just doesn't seem to be done as often in, say, psychology. We're not trying to use these models to predict future behavior or future scores. It just seems like we, we just want to know if they're related as a way of testing hypotheses. So can the regression be generalized to other data? It's something you should really be testing for anyway. If you find a relationship between a bunch of X's and Y, you probably want to confirm it. You probably want to see that it actually con is consistent. It can be done by randomly separating the data set into two halves. So if you have a big enough data set, you could randomly separate them out, like literally use a random number generator or something to randomly split the data up. Figure out the equation in one half of it. See, see if it works. See if everything predicts. And then apply that equation to the other half to see if it's consistent. So we also looking at the generalizability of your model. So you can, you can estimate the regression equation one half, apply the other half and see if it predicts. That actually give you a, a better idea of how, how well your, your equation might predict future scores. But think about this, you know, this is how we're able to do things like, you know, we take tests, 
like blood tests or do blood work and they would predict your chances of heart attack or a stroke or that kind of stuff. It's where these things come from. They're able to use regression like models to predict what might happen and give you a probability of things in the future. It, it probably is really more realistically logistic regression to try to predict your probability or something like a hazard model, which is a specialized case of that. But it's the same basic idea, trying to predict future scores for things. All right, well, what kind of sample size do you need to do a multiple regression? Because as we know, as things get more complicated, you have more variables, you need more data, you need more participants, more scores to actually run those analyses. There's no exact number to consider. It really has to do with how stable the estimates of things become. As with smaller samples, you're having things like correlation matrices and covariance matrices, the relationships between variables Smaller samples are going to vary more. You're going to get a lot more variation in the size of those relationships with small samples. As the sample size gets bigger and bigger, those are going to start to stabilize. And sort of trying to find that sweet spot where it becomes stable and you're getting sort of similar correlations across multiple samplings. So to Boston and Fidel say, you know, that in order to find a stable solution, you should shoot for somewhere around 50 plus 8M, where 50 is just the base number 8M is eight times the number of predictors that you have. So if you have five predictors, you're going to have 50 plus eight times five is 40. So you need at, at least 90 participants. Now, this is a bare minimum. You should have at least that number. More is going to be better, but you should have at least that number to, to be able to run these kinds of models. With the more predictors, right, is going to mean more participants needed. There's a lot of noise. You actually may need more than this estimate, meaning there's a lot of variability, there's a lot of messiness in the data set. You may need more than that 50 plus 8M. If there's little noise, you can get by with even less. So if you get a really tight distribution where there's not a whole lot of variability, let alone a lot of noise or error, you can probably get by with even less than this and get a stable solution with just a, a smaller number of people. Now, if you're interested in generalizing, or you want to be able to test your, you want to be able to test your regression equation and then apply it to another set to see if it generalizes, then you need to shoot for twice this number so you can actually do it in half and apply it to the other half to see if it generalizes. All right, we talk about the general linear model and, and matrix algebra, and there was, hopefully this reference is, this reference is correct. I will check it, and if not, I'll, I'll, I'll put something here to, you know, what the, what it is, but in the 2019 Tobias Fidel, Fidel book, I believe it's chapter 18 in Appendix A, and other, and other versions of the book, it may be in different places, but what you want to look for is there's a chapter on the general linear model, whatever number it is, and then there's an appendix someplace or something where they talk about matrix algebra. So just look for those two things, the, the chapter number and all that stuff doesn't matter, or what appendix it is, just look for matrix algebra and look for general linear model. Those things are, are in there somewhere, they just have moved them around through different versions. Now, with that being said, yeah, I had this thing generally linear model, and you're like, why do I just have a regression equation written out again? Because we were saying that the general linear model is really just the same thing as regression. Multiple regression is a, an application of the general linear model. A general linear model is sort of more theoretical. Basically, that you can actually predict any score for a person based on an intercept, slopes times all the predictors plus an error. Now, here's that error back again, right? So we, we actually brought the error back into this equation because we can actually predict a person's actual score if we know all this stuff about their predictors and their intercept, and we know what their error is, we know how far away they are from, uh, from their actual predicted value. So this is, you can think of this as a generalized form of regression, right? It's just a general form. If your outcome is continuous, then you're talking about sort of multiple regression. If it's dichotomous, we can apply this somewhat to with tweaks into logistic regression predictors if they're if if they're independent and coded a certain way then this could be one predictor this could be the second one this could be the interaction between them and you can have then an ANOVA if these are like grouping variables and this is the interaction this could simply be an ANOVA part of this and that and then the intercept here becomes the grand mean so it, there's th this this applies to so many different kinds of analyses and everything you've sort of done so far it's just no one really talks about it in this sense for some reason or another. Uh, Dr. Otten and I have talked about, we haven't talked about it in a long time, but years ago we actually applied for some funding to write a book to re 
three right at 320 level book an in, like an intro stats book and to start off with the gym leader model as the approach and go through it that way instead of sort of talking about all the components and working your way towards the gym leader model that you get in this class like three classes later start with this first talk about regression talk about how you can tweak regression to become a nova and 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 t-test and it never got funded and we never found a time to do it but it's something we should do we just haven't so just think about this as it's just multi regression. It's just a generalized form of regression where you're accounting for the errors. You're accounting for the relationships between the variables and the outcomes, the predictors and the outcomes. You're accounting for some intercept value, some central tendency value here. And it's just a generalized form of all that stuff. All right. So we can think about applying this to a very simple example. We have four people. I have Y, one, two, three, four, four. These are outcome scores for four people and I have an X1 score for the same four people. The intercept is going to be just the same one intercept for everybody. Everyone's going to have their own error value, right? So it's how far away they are from the predicted score and everyone's going to have the same slope, right? So when we actually regress the Y onto X1, it's going to give us one slope, one intercept, but everyone will have their own error and everyone will have their own X score to contribute to that prediction. So with four observations, we can actually create this. We can think of this as each person's individual prediction, right? And we can also then move over to talking about how, how this works with, with, uh, with, let me back up. We can think about having this equation for at, for each person and then when we come back, I'm going to start here, and we're going to we're, we're then going to take this and see how well how this really just how the, writing this out this way is really just sort of a step towards thinking about it in terms of matrix algebra in terms of matrices. So we'll then turn these into matrices and, sh and show you how that sort of works, and talk about how in the background of some of these computer programs, that's actually what's happening. They're actually solving for the slopes and intercepts using matrix algebra, not the way that we're typically used to doing so, especially when you have multiple x's. All right, so we'll come back and we'll we'll talk about how this then becomes matrix algebra, or these matrices. Okay, don't freak out. I know I'm, I know I'm saying the word matrix and matrices a lot. It's not that bad. You'll uh, it, it, it'll be a lot easier, a lot more palatable than you might think. All right, that's it.